paper in each part. Um, Sorry, Seth. <laughs> yeah, no problem. You can make uh, cones and things. Do I have to get rid of this little note here? I, I think you can, yeah. Like, uh, I don't know. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, so what I'm going to show you how to do today is basically make a cone shape and then talk about variations. This one is actually a spiral, um, which is just a variation on the cone that I'll tell you a couple ways to do it. Um, and then I'll also briefly show you sort of variation of how to cut the curves if you're or cut the angles if you're using curved parts um, but probably not going to get too far into that but the math is all the same um, there'll be a little bit of math which uh, is easy and fun um, but I'm sort of going to walk you through the process of uh, I've done a few lamps um, and you know, I'll just show you the couple others that I got here uh, this one is the geometry is just gonna be the same. It's um, just connecting these two points, but it's connected on a curve. So we'll, as far as drawing it, um, what we do, and I'm gonna have to just figure out how to, if you can see my drawings. Is that showing up well enough? Yep. Yeah, Thank you. okay. So first thing I do is I draw the outside profile, um, which you know is generally a trapezoid. If I shape the top like I did on that first one, that's something I do afterwards. Um, but I make draw the shape that I like, and then we're going to figure. I'm going to show you how to figure out the shape of each of the pieces that go into it. Um, so I'm going to have to cross in front of the camera a few times. Um, first thing I do is, so these are generally circular, even though in the end, obviously it's going to be a faceted circle, not a single one. So I've set this to the radius. Um, is this part of the paper still on here? There we go. And I've just drawn a straight line. I'm going to make a little center mark that I can see. Um, Gonna draw this circle. And hopefully that'll show up dark enough to see. Um, and then I'm also gonna do the radius down here at the bottom. And I'm gonna draw it on the same circle. Um, it is a lot easier to Cooper things if you if you're trying to have all the parts be the same and with the spiral we'll talk about how it'll be different but um if you pick an even number of pieces to divide it into uh for this one i'm gonna do it uh set it up so that it's 12 pieces and um so you can pick any point along the edge as you know the radius there's six of those right you all remember math so three gets you right to there i can keep going around and make six right um so that would divide it into six parts if i now take this so that's a sixth of my circle and if you then set it on this point draw an arc this point, draw an arc. If you get confused, you can read the book that George wrote. Uh, so now I've got a twelfth of a circle here. And I can draw this line. And that is the length of the bottom of one of my 12 staves. And this is the length of the top of one of my 12 staves. And then, and so that measurement is conveniently three inches. This one is seven eighths. And then the length of my piece is 17 inches, okay? 
Any questions yet? Out there? Um, Seth? Okay. Yep. You mentioned the book that George wrote. You're talking George Walker. Oh, sorry. Different George. Yeah. George and uh, Jim. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. I like giving everyone credit. Um, yeah. So after that, uh, what I do is I can now draw a stave. Um, so if I use um, that as my center line, well, I'll just draw it over here. So if I draw a piece that is 17 inches high, seven eighths wide, three inches wide, So that's what each stave is going to look like. At this point, um, looks like I drew that a little bit off. Maybe I missed. Yeah, a little bit. Um, at this point, I take just some scrap cardboard and I'll cut out 12 of these and I'll tape them together and look at it and make sure I still like my lampshade because I find that when something becomes three dimensional, it doesn't exactly look like my drawing. Um, which makes sense because that's two dimensional. So before you go farther and waste a bunch of material and time, make a cardboard model, make sure you like it. Um, if you want to change it, I haven't wasted a lot of time coming up with these numbers, right? I can just change this line, make it a little wider, draw another circle, measure it differently, or I can make it shorter, whatever I want to do. Um, so, uh, now to cut, oh, next thing we need to do is, um, figure out the angle between the pieces. Uh, so if it, um, if you haven't worked with compound, uh, angles and tapered, um sort of pyramid shapes like that in boxes before just conceptually a box like a normal jewelry box the miter is 45 degrees right on those um and but if you turn flatten that down sort of flatten it down into a picture frame, then your miter is 45 on the different plane. So it sort of goes from essentially 45 from one view and 90 from the other to 90 and 45. And so as the cone changes shape, the angle between the parts will also change. Um, in this shape, it changes very little. Uh, it starts to change a lot more as you get closer to it being sort of a 45 degree pyramid. But the way to uh, figure this out is you need to measure the slope. Um, let's see. So use my miter gauge or my uh, sorry, slide and bevel. Um, then I've got a uh, these used to be called bevel bosses. They no longer are being made. The new ones by eye gauging don't have quarter degree markings. They only have half degree markings, which kind of sucks. But um, anyway, you set your slide and bevel on there. That uh, reads as a 16 degree slope. Um, 16 off, so it's actually 74 degree is what's going to go into the formula. Um, and, uh, so there's a handy website, um, if I can bring it up on here, uh, called, it's a uh, pdxtex.com, write it on here. 
that is has a really nice um, compound angle calculator on it. Uh, so I don't know if this will show up. It looks like this. Is that showing? You want to use the one at the top, the compound angle calculator. It'll ask you for the slope, uh, which I'm going to put in as 74 degrees. It's going to ask for the included angle or number of sides. You don't have to do both. You don't have to do the math. So just 12 sides. Calculate. And the angle it wants me to cut it at is 14.4 degrees. So um, if it were a cylinder, uh, it's 12 pieces, 24 bevels, 360 divided by 24, 15 degrees. By changing it to that much of a cone, it only changes at 0.6 degrees. Um, so uh, that at this point, I'm going to move this and we're going to uh look more at the table hey, saw Seth while you're doing that will you say that website again a couple of people are asking yes uh pdxtex.com great it's in the chat too oh great Christy put it in there oh perfect all right so I don't know if that's too far away. You'll have to tell me how this works. Um, can you change that, King, so I can see myself bigger and see if it's, uh, see what you're seeing? Yeah, are you not big right now? No, no. You had it that way when we did the test, but um, right now I'm just a little square on the, in the bottom. Oh, weird. Because I have a spotlight for everyone. I'll I'll remove it and I'm going to try it again. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Um, not better. You still little. Nope. Still little. But just tell me if you can't. If I need to move it closer, if you can't see what I'm doing. Looking pretty good, I think, right now. Okay. So um, you can set the blade angle. Uh, however you like, um, using a Wixie gauge, or there's better ones of these, uh, or I often do it off of here. Um, and so it said it was 14.4, so a little under 14.5. Um, by doing an even number, you get a little bit of grace because you can glue up two halves and then make them flat. Um, but these are also good. So sometimes I'll do both, see if they agree. Uh, when you're doing this, of course, make sure that your uh, bevel gauge is 90 degrees to the blade. If this ends up twisted, you're gonna get a different number and when you're aiming for tenths of a degree, it all helps. So I'll check it with this. This is a little different. So you can decide whether you trust the analog or the digital or uh, halfway in between. Um, if I'm doing a cylinder where it's just 15 degrees, uh, what I'll do is take a flat piece of wood. I will cut the angle on one side, turn it around, cut it on the other, and then I'll cross cut this into 12 pieces and put it together and see if the joint's right. So you can, with if you're doing a cylinder or anything like that, it's really simple. With a cone, unfortunately, you have to cut each piece to a taper, and so you get one shot. Um, but back to, that's why it's really helpful to use an even number, because I'll talk about that later when you get to the glue up and how you can adjust it. So um, my 
uh, calculations came up with 17 inches long, which this is. Uh, I needed three inches wide. This is a little more than three inches wide. Um, your staves need to be really flat. Uh, can't emphasize that enough. Good to mill them, let them sit, mill them again. Uh, if they aren't flat, uh, it's just going to be miserable. So uh, make sure they are. Um, and have a, one straight edge. They don't have to both be straight because they're actually both getting cut off. Um, so on this, I marked a center line here and here on my stave. I marked my seven eighths width at one end and my three inch width at the other. So I don't need to draw the lines because I just need to be connecting the points. Um, and I'm going to show you how to set up, do the jig. Uh, so MDF or plywood, whatever you got that's flat and cheap. Um, and the first step is to cut your plywood. Um, this is one I've used before. It's got a different angle on there. Uh, so I'm going to recut this so that I have an edge. doesn't matter what this is set at. I just need to waste a little bit of this here. So give me a sec to make that cut and then we'll set up the rest of the jig. Okay, so I've transferred my marks to the ends um, and so that I can set this so that, let me think. So uh, first off, I'm gonna put the bottom, the wide part on the side going away from me. And that is just so that I can have, you'll, it'll make more sense when I cut it, but it'll allow me to have a little bit more um, of a backstop on the second cut. So I'm gonna line this up. Um, if you don't have enough of these, they're made by uh, Tom's Chinese affiliate. Dalishi. Uh, they've got like 12 of them for 25 bucks. So the Dalishi Clamp Company. Um, anyway, so I'm clamping this down with my marks. I don't know if that'll show. Where's the camera on there? Right. With my mark yep. right up to the line because I know where the, the blade is cutting now. And now I can set up a couple stops um, so that I can repeat this because I will, if I need 12 saves, I'll probably make 15 uh, just to be safe. Um, so it needs a side stop and an end stop uh, so that they're all oriented the same. This also is good because it will uh, ensure that your screws are not where they're going to get cut off. So, um, one thing just to be aware of that I forgot to mention is. Uh, this is going to be the inside. 
So this is actually going to be a little bigger by the thickness of this wood. I should have moved the line over for to compensate for that if I really care. Uh, but it's a demo. So you understand, right? Because I marked my outside measurement on what is effectively going to be the inside here. So what I could have done is, well, I can do it actually. Um, I can mark, so I've got the outside marked here. Um, and I can use the 14 degree angle to draw onto here. Oh, this probably this this stop should probably still be the same, um, and I probably just have to move this one. So it's going to come back. Yep. So you can see now is that showing up? My little mm -hmm. beveled yep. line. Yep. So now I am marked because I'm I marked the outside and I'm cutting the inside. So uh, of course this barely makes it now. Um, and so always with these, you know, make sure your screws are safely out of the way of the blade. Uh, make sure that your sled is wide enough that when your handles don't hit the fence, that this edge does. Um, and so now I'm just going to uh, repeat that last cut, but with a piece of wood on there. All right. Uh, any questions so far? So now I have to turn it around this way. Um, so I'll cut all my pieces with that. This is really good for people who like doing production stuff, which I kind of do. Um, I'm going to have to move this. So for the second side of this, uh, I use the off cut um, to make my, my side stop because it has the, the complementary bevel. Good. And I'm going to do the same thing with lining up my beveled line to the edge that I'll be cutting. And with these, you want firm pressure, but you don't need to be killing yourself over it. There we go. Add a little bit of this off.
Not a very straight drill bit. Okay, I'm going to make one more cut. So I just did what I told you not to. And this handle is uh, hanging over when we hit the fence. So you can just angle them any which way works for you. I often just do three screws because I'm lazy, but uh, always have two in the front because that's where the pressure is on it. Sorry, I was used to using this jig. What I forgot to do on this one, this also repurposed from a previous project, is I didn't recut this before I set all those stops. So you got to recut it because I actually don't, that isn't the line it's going to cut to. But for the purposes of this demo and not using up a lot of time, I can set this so that the edge of the tooth, this is a completely different angle here, but as long as the edge of the tooth is right at the edge of the plywood. I know these. this is parallel because this is what it was used for. So I can make this work. All right, so there we got stave one. Um, and as you can see, I mean, it, it takes 30 seconds to pop one of these in and cut it. Uh, if you're doing 12, you spend more time milling them than you do cutting these. Uh, super quick process. So, um, any questions to that point? That is how you make a stave that 12 of these are gonna make the shape I want. We look pretty good on questions, Seth. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, the way I glue up these is um, by taping them, which probably a lot of you have taped mitered boxes and things like that. It's basically the same thing. I do not have an entire um, cone to tape up, but a few things I would show you on that, um, on how to do it, is, let's see if we can get this the point down here. Um, 
think that's in the right place. Um, so these are leftover pieces from another project, but um, basically what I'm doing is uh, tearing little pieces. You make sure it's really well stuck on one. You get them lined up and you stretch the tape and then put it down and it'll pull the joint nice and tight. So on like the bigger coffee tables where it's just, in, if you go into a full circle, it's easy because you can then pull this whole thing together and it makes the full circle and you can wrap it with tape. Um, but uh, if you're just doing a curved panel and you're using thicker wood where you need more pressure, then you need to make clamp blocks and uh, actually use clamps. But for thin stuff and lamps, this is what I usually do. Um, and what I will do is I'll uh, do my whole set um, and make sure it fits together. If but I will, if it doesn't, so if it's a cylinder and the joints are all good, I'll just glue up the whole thing as one um, in one fell swoop. If it's not quite perfect, I will glue all the joints except two that are opposite for, from each other. Uh, but I will, I will tape it all up as a cylinder so that it holds the shape. And then after the glue sets, I can um, take those two halves and sand them. I can put self-adhesive. See how much this tape stretches? Pretty good. Um, if you need even stretchier tape, the green frog tape is stretchier, but it's more expensive. Uh, but I could do a half circle, two half circles, and then I can put uh, self-adhesive sandpaper on a flat surface with my two halves. These, uh, this obviously isn't a half. Uh, after it's glued and sand it. Um, so if I'm off by a tenth of a degree or something like that or half a degree or whatever, I can fix that joint and then glue the two halves together. The other advantage of doing it in parts that way is the squeeze out on the inside is a bit of a pain to deal with. And it's a lot easier working like this than working inside a full cone. Um, I often will tape these edges just to make cleanup easier. Depends on the piece. Um, we'll deal with that when it comes. Uh, so just a couple variations. Uh, I wanted to show you um, so, uh, this cone is done. There's two ways to do a spiral, um, at least two that I've found. Uh, this one, what I did is each piece just gets smaller. And all I did is on the second cut uh, with that jig, every one, I just moved the fence over by whatever amount I wanted, right? So you can draw your spiral. You can, using your sliding bevel, mark one angle to the next and play with different size, uh, a different progression of you know how much you're subtracting and see what spiral you end up with. Um, or you can draw your the spiral you want and then divide it, whatever. It's it's a little bit of fussy geometry to kind of get around that. The other way to make a spiral is to use the same width pieces. Um, so these are all the same width, but I changed the angle on it. Uh, that's honestly more trouble um, because 
you know, this piece might be uh, 12 degrees on, you know, bevel on this side and 14 on this side, and, or I guess it would be opposite, sorry. Um, getting tighter as it goes this way. Uh, the advantage though is if I want to do any, you know, it, it's just a visual thing. So on this one, I wanted these to be spaced evenly, which meant that the staves had to be the same space. Um, and yeah, that leads me to these sort of cutouts are really pretty easy to do uh, before you glue it up. Um, I had a few. Yeah. For that first lamp I showed you, I played around with some uh, different um, sort of cutouts. So these were just done on a, a little spindle sander. And then these were done, uh, this is what I ended up choosing was sort of one more rounded one and one one thinner one. Um, so anyway, you can play around with stuff like that. Uh, when you making curved pieces is a little tricky. You these curves all need to be really similar. Uh, otherwise, it's like doing working with warped wood, where you cut your joint and these won't fit just right. So lots of ways to either cut or laminate or steam bend consistent parts, but that's a longer discussion. Um, what I did want to briefly show you, though, is um, how to make a jig for the uh, cutting an angle on the curved part. Also things, you know, if you want to shape the ends of the pieces, that's sort of what this was, you know, all of that, it's easier to do all that sort of stuff before it's glued up. So even, um, so I, I taped this thing up, I put it into a spiral, I marked uh, this spiral that I wanted, the shapes I wanted, I took it apart, I shaped them, I taped it back, looked at it, changed it, took it apart. You go through a lot of tape with this, but um, it's all of everything you're doing is kind of easier before it's uh, it's glued up. This is another um, spiral in, in progress. So it's it's just taped. Uh, and I'm playing around with trying to decide if I want to spiral the top on it again or what I want to do with it. Um, you can also see uh, I numbered these. So I made a number of extra ones. Um, and the widths, so I was making them smaller by a certain progression. The ones I ended up choosing are 1, 1, 2, 4, 6, 7, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So they were all evenly spaced, but then it didn't actually make the spiral I wanted. So I just started playing with the parts until I started getting closer to the spiral I want. And it's not quite there, but I may have to make a few more. Uh, so... These, um, I've been cutting on the bandsaw just really carefully uh, and getting them close enough. Um, the jigs for, uh, the jigs for this one, because uh, it's, because I was angling it this way, these pieces had to sit in this orientation. Um, and one thing I wanna show you is, so on these, the pieces are narrower at the top than they are at the bottom, right? 
just like the straight ones. So I did my math by drawing the, the trapezoid, the, the cone that connects this point and that, and ignoring all of this. That gave me my um, blade angle. It also uh, meant that these pieces, um, for this to be wider than that, uh, sorry, getting cut this way. Let me put this down. Um, the farther the piece is up in the air, the wider it is because it's riding on this side of the blade, the blade's angled that way. So for this to be narrower, it has to be closer to the base. Um, and so you got to make a sled that supports it at an angle. With the flat pieces, I'm just angling it this way. With the curved ones, um, I have to angle it this way to get the effect I want. So this one was the first cut. And then this one, which is sort of the opposite, I flip it around and that's for the second cut. And these were uh, just attached with double stick tape with a really good uh, enter tape, whatever the number is um stuff uh but these sleds also could have been made longer with the uh delishi clamps um the other one that uh the basswood one because it's curving um this way Instead of being uh, a shell shape, it's more of a, a hat shape. These went through with um, the sled uh, holding it concave side up. Um, I cut this this curve. This was left over. I, I was band sawing all my parts. This was the leftover one. Then I had to make a tapered shim to hold it at the right angle to get the amount of taper I wanted from one end to the other. And then there's an opposite one here. And I have enough of these parts left over from that other. I've got eight of them. So I'm going to try and make a lamp that the pieces do a little bit more um, like this, that they will separate because I only have eight pieces and I didn't want the lamp to be super small. So it's going to bevel out, but my pieces aren't wide enough to be solid. So I'm going to see what that looks like, kind of like feathers. Um, and this is the jig I made for that because here I only need to bevel the first half. So, um, all that to show you, there's a lot of variations you can do. Start with a straight one and like get the math and the concepts and the angles. And then uh, feel free to play with curves or spirals. You can do ellipses also. Um, instead of a cone, it can be a elliptical cone by varying the width of the pieces. So if there's 16 pieces, there'll be four wide, four narrow, you know, for medium narrow and for medium wide. Um, and you can make a, uh, an ellipse that way. So lots to play with. I'm just uh, starting to scratch the surface of it. Yeah. Very cool. And, you got time for a quick question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, Bill, you want to jump in? Bill Pierce, I see that you've got a question there. Bill, you there? There I am. <clears throat> there you are. Yeah, I was just wondering if you, were you saying that you um, you just tape the joints uh, during glue up or 
also, or you just use the tape to hold it in place and then you put some kind of band clamp or rubber uh, hose around it to provide extra tension? Um, if the joints are good, the tape will be just fine. Um, and if you know if if you can't close the joint with tape, I think a band clamp is probably just going to make the whole thing explode. Uh, at least with these sort of things, I'm usually using wood that's sort of under three eighths. Um, when I'm doing the coffee table panels, uh, I use clamps, yeah, and a whole lot more pressure. Uh -huh. um, with these, one thing that's really helpful, especially with the curved ones, if you get any chatter from the table saw is um, I'll put a 220 grit self-adhesive paper on my table saw and then you can just sand the edge afterwards uh -huh. um, and it'll just clean it up beautifully and, and uh, work well as long as you have a very flat surface and um, you know, hold it carefully. So sort of like sharpening. Okay. I, I just want to make sure I also understood that you, for the, for the curved ones, you're, you're actually um, uh, bending those first and then you put those on a curved sled to go through your table saw to cut the, um, the bevel angles on the staves. Yes. Yeah. I haven't actually done one where I've bent the wood first. I've only, so far I've only been cutting the wood to curves, but um, to do bigger pieces, uh, you got to bend them. Um, there's a very cool coffee table you've probably seen by Adrian Ferrazzuti that uh, is done in this method. It's um, big uh, bent laminated curves that are coopered just at part of the joint uh, or part of the, the length of it. Um, and then Yuri Kobayashi, uh, also does really incredible. Uh, she steam bends uh, really consistent parts and then coopers them. And so you can get really great compound curves that way. So I'd check out both of their works. Hey, Seth, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. In the, you know, the, the few um, photographs that we put in the newsletter, one of them is a glass top table, kind of has an oval glass top and you have two curved pieces at the base. Can you briefly describe how you made those? Yeah, so that's just those. Um, each side of that base is just five pieces cut at, I think it's like five or six degrees. Um, oh. I usually put some biscuits in there to help keep things from sliding around. And I kind of make a form that to help me clamp it. Uh, sometimes I clamp them in pairs first and then clamp those pairs together. Um, and that, it looks more complicated than it is. It is actually just a uh, arc of a cylinder, but I cut the bottom at an angle so that it tilts. And then I cut the ends of the cylinders just at a taper. So it looks like it's tapered and curved and much more complicated, but it is really just a perfect arc of a cylinder. No kidding. Okay. Now, are you telling me that piece is actually faceted? No, no. So it, 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 it started faceted. I made the pieces as five facets. Um, then I actually drew the inside and outside curve on the ends and I cove cut the inside pretty darn close oh. with multiple, multiple cove cuts on each one, just sort of sneaking up to my line. And on the outside, I um, cut a couple facets on the table saw, but then just uh, hand planed that. But the inside, because of the concave curve is kind of hard to sand and shape, I got that really close by coat cutting and then um, used curved scrapers. Oh, okay. All right. Great. Very cool. Same, same on that other... Coffee table, similar concept with the spike things yeah. coming out. Yeah. yeah, that one's just vertical instead of being tilted. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, here's uh, somebody. Oh, it's George. George Knudsen, you've got a... Sorry, George. Lauren was right before you. Um, Lauren was, if that's okay, George. 
Lauren, do you have a question? Lauren Steele? Lauren, you there? Paging Lauren. You unmute. Yeah, let me ask him to. Lauren, you need to unmute. There, can you hear me now? There you go, yep. Okay, so how thick is the wood you're using in the demonstration? And could you use much thinner wood? And if you did, would it create any issues on the angles or fitting up and gluing and so forth? Uh, so this woods I, I was using was about three eighths. Um, I've gone down to about five sixteenths. I think if you get too small, it might get trickier to um, to orient it. But I don't see any actual problems doing it with thinner wood. Yeah, I'd experiment. And, and do you have a it, depending on uh, let's see how many staves there be. 12 staves uh what about the uh the glue up are there issues with uh the time it takes to get the glue on before it starts to cure and get sticky not really because i so um i uh just run a bead of glue down here and a brush and that's it you know real quick you could get you can do a dozen of those in under a minute and then fold it up and it's it's done um yeah but you can do it in parts too just uh uh be careful if you're trying to make an actual cylinder with a spiral you've got lots of wiggle room because you know it doesn't have to line up with anything but with a cylinder you want it to eventually line up so it's better to tape it as a cylinder, even if you're gl only gluing some of the joints, just to make sure it all stays aligned. And and uh, if, if you were making, whether it's a cone or a cylinder, and you wanted the top and bottom ends to be parallel, say with a tabletop, uh, do you cut that before assembly or wait until afterwards? Yes, yes and that uh, calculator, um, the online calculator gives you a bevel angle and an end angle. So if you want to make it sit flat, uh, it gives you the angle that you cut the ends at. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yep. All right, George. Sorry about that. Uh, no, no problem. Um, so Seth, when you're when you're used, cutting curved staves, and you're cutting the curve on the staves themselves on the bandsaw. You said. So yeah. there's a, a template uh, or a flush trim, sort of a jig to to, to, to make yeah. that. Do you yeah. use that same um, guide to cut the form piece as the carrier to then yeah. put the stave onto the table saw? Okay, yeah. so, you, so you get that matching curve yeah. on the inside, okay. Do you find that you have to do any sanding on any of that at all to smooth it out or? Oh yeah, you got to sand it to smooth it. But um, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Uh, you're good, George. Yep. Bill, you got another question? A little more philosophical. Yeah, a little philosophical question uh, that I think is a good question. I'd like to get your take on. Why do you think that humans find beauty in geometric shapes? Huh. Well, I kind of like organic shapes more myself, so I might not be the best one to answer it. Um, you know, I, I think we like things that we make and uh, order and, uh, you know, some people tend more towards order and some more towards chaos. Uh, so I think it's a... Um, an opinion. My parents were both architects that graduated from architecture school in 1955, so we're sort of in the modernist era, and I grew up in a house with very uh, square walls and 90 degree corners, and then I went to New Mexico and built a house out of uh, mud, car tires, and tin cans that uh, it was much easier to make a curve than a straight line, and so there really weren't any straight lines. 
And uh, my brother, who was also who was also an architect, came and he absolutely hated the house. Uh, I loved it. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Greg, Greg, you've got a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, you mentioned uh, the difficulty at times uh, of cleaning up squeeze out on the inside. I was mm -hmm. just wondering, you mentioned something about tape taping it. Do you try to align the tape after you make the tapered cut or do you tape the blank and then cut through the tape so that you have a perfect right. alignment? That's a good idea. I haven't tried that. <laughs> I might try it. As long as the tape doesn't get fuzzy, that would probably be a, a really convenient method. And I would guess then you'd have to do it to both sides so the tape doesn't tilt your well the outs the outside is easy to sand so i mean i don't worry about that i mean the other other taper on a stave yeah, yeah so yeah. tape them both at the same time so you don't have a, a a slight tilt oh right yeah 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 okay yeah i think i've tried doing things like that before and lining up that piece of paper a uh, piece of tape and then following up with an exacto knife and you know it's never perfect so yeah yeah all right yeah yeah i'll give it a shot thanks hey i've got another uh, kind of a design question for you seth how did seth roll i'm going back to that coffee table again okay on the the cheat with the the oval top i know yep. you built that a while ago right so maybe you don't yep. recall but possibly you do when you're doing something like that, did you did you conceive of those angles at that time and the smooth curves, or did you say, okay, well, here I've made these cylinders. Wouldn't it be cool to to angle them, or or did you design it and then say, okay, shit, now I got to figure out how to build this? <laughs> yeah, I always do that. I, I designed it. I, I made a model that I just bandsawed the curves, and yeah, and then okay. sort of how I make it. Yeah. Okay. Figure it out, figure it out as you go, kind of thing. Yep. Yep. Great, cool. Like the way you think. Who else? Anybody? Oh, Mark, sorry. Mark, go ahead. Um, hi, Seth. Um, so you've, uh, I think it was brought up a little bit in an earlier question uh, about the thickness of the. Uh, the pieces of your window of your uh, lampshades, but I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what you've learned about ways of uh, making those shades translucent. So, uh, you know, so you've tried some perforations uh, and uh, um, certainly uh, really thin pieces would might also uh, allow for that. Uh, what, can you tell us a little bit about what you've experimented along those lines? Uh, yeah, that's about it, really. Um, I, I put some perforations in the spiral was kind of a way to let some light out. Uh, I think if the wood was thin enough to be translucent, it would be too thin to machine and glue up into a structural shape, but I might be wrong on that. Yeah. I, I don't know a lot about it, but, uh, okay. well, I look forward to seeing what you do. You're on the cutting edge though. <laughs> I've got to make a lamp at some point. And I'm I'm thinking along those lines. Yeah. Very cool. Well, we're at about eight oh six. Anybody else got last question for? Uh, oh, George. Uh, I was just going to ask it. Have you experimented with with finishes that might allow more of that glow to come through? Do oil based finishes versus you know penetrating finishes? versus surface finishes, uh, any difference there at all, you think? You know, the wood I'm using is way too thick. So I, I don't think, if there was a finish that would let light through three-eighths wood, I would love to see it. <laughs> <Yeah>. Your piece <laughs> is pretty much the light comes out the bottom, Seth. Is that the idea? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So honestly, these don't, you know, they aren't good room lighting things. They're, they're good over a table or for mood lighting, but... Um, so far, I, I uh, haven't been, I've made some lamps and sold them, but um, not a lot, and I'm not really sure what the market is. 
uh, as far as usefulness. Uh, but they're fun to make. Uh, they might, cool. there, there might be the downside for uh, letting some of that light through if, if it's coming through a, a bad glue joint. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good place to put a hole. <laughs> yeah, <there you> go. <laughs> Design opportunity. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right cool well any, anybody else going once going twice I, I got a quick one yeah uh, I remember when you spoke to the club before and you showed I, I may not be able to present this properly but I think it was using the bandsaw and, and cutting curves uh, yep. so it fans out right yep. have you oh, thought of yeah. trying to combine these interesting shapes in, in any way? Uh, well, they're sort of two different concepts. The, the, the curve cut ones is all about using one piece of wood to generate a shape. And so there's no need to cooper it because there's no wood to join. Um, but the shapes are related in that they're sort of multiple uh, multiple elements that kind of imply a curve afterwards. And that was one thing I didn't mention is obviously the number of parts you use will determine how much it reads as a curve and how much it reads faceted. So, you know, if you use a uh, 96 pieces to make your cylinder, it's going to be pretty darn smooth um, of a curve. And if you use six, it's going to, you know, read as a hexagon. Cool. All right. I think that's pretty much it then, right? Guys, Nick, is that, uh, we're at 8.09. Yeah, that's probably it, unless anybody's got any more short questions. Let's not let them go. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I, I, think, I think we're good. Hey, thanks, Seth. That was great. Excellent job, Seth. Yeah, a lot of good comments coming through. You know, fantastic. Great stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you very much. Cool. Well, enjoy the rest of your meeting, and uh, I'll see you another time. All right. All right. Good night, Let's Seth. Go ahead and remove the spotlight. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Seth. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. I guess do we want to um, start the rest of the festivities by um, seeing if we've got any of the new members on, and if so, if they could introduce themselves real quick. You need to unmute yourselves. And I wonder if, if Jerry's on to point them out. Jerry, Jerry, I think is missing tonight, isn't he? Jerry is missing, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Vacation. Well, I'm Gary Bazowski, and I think I'm a new member. Uh, this is the first meeting I've actually attended. Joined probably a couple months ago. Cool. Excellent. Hi, Gary. Welcome. Gary, where are you located? I'm uh, living up on Camino Island. I'm a oh. CPA, still working uh, in a smallish practice. And uh, I've been woodworking for, I don't know, 15 years or so. Still building out a, a shop up in Camino. What kind of stuff do you like to build? Well, besides cutting boards. <laughs> 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 some cabinetry, some tables. Um, I did a lot of work in uh, on a house on Woodby Island that I remodeled. So I did things like building all the cabinets and the uh, made a bunch of custom moldings and put in wood floors, those kind of things. Cool. Nice. Have you ever built a cutting board like Barry does the size of a small flatbed <laughs> truck? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe a, a Nissan pickup truck, but you know, not uh, okay. <laughs>
I could make a comment, Barry, about, you know, compensation issues, but I won't. I won't, I won't say that because this is a, like a family environment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> Love the support. <laughs> We're here for you. Yeah. Why did I say yes? Why did I say yes? <laughs> right. Okay. Um, before we get into more personal abuse, uh, any other new members? Okay. Um, do we want to do bring in Bragg now, Greg? Sure. Uh... We only have one. Oh. And uh, I'm going to let me see. I'll share my screen here. I can figure out where that uh, where that is. Huh. Middle on the bottom. Uh, the bottom. There we go. And then pick your screen. Mr. Bucknell. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, following the box making class uh, prompted by Andrew Pellar at Barry Tonkin's shop, he challenged everybody to make a box. And I used to make boxes a lot, as some of you know. And so uh, then I was contacted by a friend of ours who she his, her mother wanted a, uh, a box to hold uh, tea bags for her one of her daughters and she liked my other boxes but none of them were really sized appropriately or had dividers in it so I built this one which is dovetail corners using the Keller dovetail jig uh, I'm not ready to get back into hand cut dovetails again that's been I've done it once and then decided what jig to buy but anyway um, so this is a design that I had used once before on a box which you'll see where the the lid had, which is a figured maple has a insert of the same walnut that's in the box. And then if you do the next picture, Greg. Okay. There you can see the, the dividers and you can see that in the lid, it has the walnut piece, which is relieved for your finger. And then in the, in the base, it has the figured maple piece. So it just reverses the lid and the side. And it makes it just in, sort of intuitive of how you open the box. And it's got the brass rod hinges similar to what Jerry does in his box class. So next picture. Yeah, so there's just a view of how you you see it when you're going to open it. And I finished it with uh, Levos, which I've never used before, but George gave me uh, a bit of that in a stop loss bag, and I wanted to give it a try. And I, I liked the way it went on, and it wasn't real fumey, so that it aired out quickly when it was done. And so I was pretty, pretty happy with that. So thank you, George. And I... I don't know if there's another picture or not. I think that was the last one. No, one more. Oh, there's just one. Just one more. So anyway, there it is. So it's walnut and uh, quilted maple. Very nice. That's it. Nice, yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Right. Okay. Here we go. Okay, Greg, did you want to talk about your other item? Oh Please. yeah. Um, I got a call twenty minutes before the meeting from uh, Greg, Greg Klassen. Uh, he's a woodworker out by Linden and has spoke to the club uh, probably 10 years ago, if, if I remember right. Uh, but he and his partner um, have a slab cutting business, I guess. And they are having a sale on Saturday, October 20th um, out in Linden. And he just wanted me to announce it tonight. He's going to send me a flyer, which I will get to um, to 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 uh, Al to send out to the club. So when he has the time set up and so forth and directions, uh, you'll get it. But just uh, be aware that on the twenty eighth of of October, Saturday, uh, he'll have uh, slabs, and he said he's also going to sell some of his surplus hardwood. So uh, might be an opportunity to get some some pieces. That's all I got. Okay, thanks, Ray. Mm -hmm. I got a quick thing, real quick. Um, just a commercial, and maybe you were going to do it, but 
the uh, Whatcom Studio Tour. Greg is going to be a participant in that as well, if you want to go see his other venture, as well as our own esteemed Mr. King. Uh, we'll be open to have studio tours and people rummage through his shop, <laughs> which I will come, be doing. Come and judge me. <laughs> ah, absolutely. <laughs> that would be great. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Was what was the other one? That, that, this the same guy Greg was talking about. Is that is that what? I'm... Yeah, it's his other business. So uh, Greg is on the studio tour, showcasing his his tables, his river tables and cabinets that he does. Not the slab business, which is a new venture uh, that I, he's doing mm -hmm. with his partner. Oh, okay. Barry, did you have a date on the when that uh, starts? Yeah, so the Whatcom Studio Tour and Tom DeLisi is also included. He's done it the last couple of years as well. Um, great opportunity to go see the gallery and some of the things they're doing in their shop. It's the 7th and 8th of this month, so this weekend. And it's also the 14th and the 15th of this month, which is the next weekend. Yep, first two weekends in October. Yeah, and you can pick up a brochure um, from quite a few of the, the vendors um, or studios. I don't know if you you have some, King, but uh, I picked up a couple from Tom. So um, it's cool. well worth it, and it's it's really fun. Lots of artists, glass woodworkers, you name it. Um, great to look at, you know, kind of the making spaces and, you know, kind of find out who's in the community. Yeah. Highly recommend Cool. Okay. Do we want to get into the uh, committee reports? Yeah, but before, who who was that guy that was just speaking with the headphones on? Does he have some kind of position with this group? No, he crashed the meeting. I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it just showed up. Yeah, it's, we should be so, more selective, I guess. So someone... this is uh, this is Barry. Okay, he is the new vice president because uh, mm -hmm. he was the last one to leave my slab class. So I grabbed him. <laughs> and... That was about the size of it. I try to yeah. run away, it just tackled me. It's just gotta be was, quicker, uh, Barry. I know, he, he, I know. He was too weak from listening to me jabber on for like two <laughs> hours, so he couldn't resist. Anyway, welcome, Garrett Barry, for uh, to the board and and vice Thank presidency, you. and we're expecting. Wonderful things from you. In fact, we've already seen some good things. He's been uh, jumping in uh, with uh, some 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 good uh, good contributions to Andrew's uh, education committee, uh, which Andrew yeah. is going to give us a, a brief sure. <laughs> brief overview about. Okay, saving saving Barry from that embarrassment. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Rankin's everybody, uh, tell uh, tell welcome to Barry when you get a chance. Okay. That's a nice segue. Thanks, King. That's a nice segue into Andrew. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Andrew Peller. I'm in charge of the Education Committee. You've probably heard me beg for teachers and uh, turns out to be an echo chamber. So we're going to be trying something a little bit different. And we got a couple things in the fire. What uh, we're going to try and do is work with uh, mentorships and take that mentorship and develop it into a class, and then we're going to try the class out on a few people that are a little more enthusiastic and wouldn't mind trying to get involved in the, but they're not ready to get involved in the um, education process, but not ready to teach a class themselves. So um, I have two irons in the fire. One is a class on routers, uh, big shoes to fill there. The late, great Jim Hickey used to teach that class. I co-taught it with him for a few times, but um, I think we need to bring that one back. And we have a project-based class that we're working on. It's going to be a serving tray, um, compound, miter, angles, router template work, veneer work. And um, we're hoping that the router class is November, December, and then the other class may be in um December or January, and then thrown in there, I'm working on um, a couple of people have asked about hand tools, and I'm in the process of putting together uh, a multi-part class on hand planes, using them, and then potentially rehabbing them. So a lot of stuff in the fire. If you'd like to get involved, 
and you're not ready to teach, but you're enthusiastic and you want to learn, please shoot me an email so I can add you to the list of guinea pigs. So when we try out the classes to adjust the flow and stuff like that, I would be looking to uh, include you and then bring you into the process when we actually teach the class for real. Cool. Thanks, Andrew. You're welcome. Um, any any questions from Andrew for Andrew on that before we segue into the next person? Okay, as okay. Uh, as Andrew said, he's 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 begging for teachers. I did it. How hard can it be? Right? You survived barely. Okay, but you know, if you teach a class, you might get a vice president out of it. You you just never know what what can happen. You never know. <laughs> I'm not sure anybody needs that. <laughs> <laughs> Too late now, Barry. Uh, Andrew, okay. I'll, uh, as always, I'll be your uh, I'll be a guinea pig for any one of those classes. So yeah, okay, I'd love to help. Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, I'd uh, I'd probably be a guinea pig for the uh, router class too. Okay, I was looking for better ways to not cut any of my body parts off. Okay, um, thank you. How about uh, Bill? You want to talk about um, talk about the library? Anything of interest happening new there? Okay, so um, uh, nothing really new going on. Just obviously no library tonight. But uh, if we have the uh, in person meeting next month, the uh, library will be open for business. And keep an eye on the newsletter for a list of new books we added over the summer. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Um, programs. Peter? Are you still on? Let's see. Am I unmuted now? Yep. You're good. Um, programs has nothing really new to report. We are desperately searching for a presenter for November and round out the year with a recap. If uh, I guess uh, it's going to be a big fat surprise when it all happens. So <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's got any huge uh, ideas, let us know. We plan on meeting as a committee next week and uh, really uh, diving into this thing. So that's where we're at. Now, don't we have, we, I thought we had November figured out, no? Great. Oh, possibly. Yeah, we have. Uh, oh, I was muted. Yeah. We've got, we've got Greg uh, uh, Kanker is going to do uh, oh, the, vacuuming, uh, the vacuum presentation with George's okay. help and okay. cheering and uh, somebody else is in there, I think. Charlie is keeping pretty quiet on that, but I think he he's got some stuff to say. That's that's what I know. And that's I your know chance, you Charlie. Yes or no? <laughs> yeah, I've got a little bit I could add. There you go. <laughs> okay. Is that is that um, do you guys know is that going to be a, a in person deal or a, a strictly Zoom or a, a in person? Hybrid? It'll be in person. In person. Okay. We do okay. need to confirm that the school is available. It would it wouldn't hurt for us to confirm that before we go too far down the line. Okay, and that's for the November meeting. Yeah. Yep. I know they do have they have Christmas yeah. programs and things that at the end of the year leading into the holidays. Yeah, they, sporting uh, sporting events too. Yeah. Okay. I will I will check with Brandon and see what uh see I think it. we pretty much cleared our our standard first Tuesday of the month throughout the calendar, but um there have been there just there have been, been issues that have popped up. A couple of times, yeah. Wouldn't hurt yeah. a couple of months to work with. Confirm it. Oh, Might not uh, just uh confirm December while you're at it, you know, or yeah, yeah, right. That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll check with Brandon and uh 
I'll let the board know. Okay. If I can jump, if I can jump in, Nick, uh, uh, Peter and Craig and I are going to try to get together uh, next week, apparently, uh, to to really address uh, maybe the first couple of weeks, uh, first couple of months, months, first meetings next year. Uh, none of us are. We're kind of an ad hoc program committee, so we don't know what's going to happen, but our our responsibilities have been this year, so, but we can't just do nothing for next year. So that's on our agenda. Uh, if anybody has any great ideas for that, uh, I'm relatively new at this stuff. And uh, I'd lean on Craig and Peter a lot because they've got a lot more uh, input on that than I. Well, we welcome ideas for programs. Thank you. Hey, one okay. suggestion for uh, programs. I've mentioned it to a couple people. This is Mark Krause. Um, Tom McLaughlin, who runs Epic Woodworking, is going to be doing a uh, road show. Uh, he's generally doing one each spring. And uh, we could try to approach him and see if he, we could get him interested in stopping by and presenting in person to. Uh, our guild at one of the meetings. Uh, he's based up in New Hampshire. He loads up his van and truck and he and his wife drive cross country. Um, last year, they did a trip from New Hampshire down to roughly St. Louis area. And they're looking for to set up this year. Um, I know a, a month ago, they were very actively soliciting for uh, guilds to uh, approach them and that we have suggestions as to, you know, their interest in uh, his coming out there. And obviously, you know, he has to put together an agenda that's where he can piece together a road trip that makes sense. I don't know if he's going to want to come all the way out to, you know, the northwest corner of the U.S., but uh, He's a heck of a presenter. He's a great instructor. If you've ever gone to Epic Woodworking or gone on his YouTube channel, he's, he's done 200 plus episodes. He teaches Boku uh, classes and, you know, is really a very, very uh, accomplished woodworker. It'd be great to have someone like him in person. Yeah, he'd that's be great a, input. Yeah, that's great input. Yeah. If you would. If you would uh, hunt that down and get us some information on that, Mark, I'd really welcome that. Details. Uh, we can talk. Yeah, the Thank first you. thing is just a, an email to info at epicwoodworking.com. And just, you know, it would have to be, you know, from one of the officers of the club that can represent the club. Um, you know, and just say that, hey, you know, we understand that you're putting together your spring uh, road trip. You know, this is who we are. We would, if you would be interested in coming to the Pacific Northwest, you know, we would love to have you. And you might want to, you know, just point out that there's a Wood Turners group in the same area up here. And, you know, in other words, it's, you know, is it really going to be worth his time to, you know, make the, the trek all the way up to this corner? And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, we could convince him or people like him, you know, to come out and present, you know, and of course on the West coast, there's lots of other places that would be of interest to him to stop by and present, you know, at, um, or Townsend maybe even. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 Didn't and there, you um... could string together a couple of those things in, in your, you know, in the email and suggest it to him. Uh, the, you know, the more support we have, the, you know, the better chance that he might consider that as an option. Yeah, it, it always it always helps when trying to recruit people like that to, to mention, you know, be an aim dropper. I mean, it's it's right. blatant, but, you know, there's we've had a we've had a pretty impressive list of, of big time presenters from different parts of the country. And and that that tells them something. Uh, and and it gives them, you know, hey, I, I know, I know Seth Rowland. I'm going to give him a call and see see what his impression was. Uh, yeah, 
Didn't did we um, didn't we have uh, didn't we have him as a presenter last year? Yeah, on Zoom. Zoom. Yeah, Zoom. Did. A Zoom. Did a Zoom. Yeah, he. Twice. I think he presented twice on Zoom, if I remember yeah. right. Yeah. Because he's real comfortable with that. Hey, real quick, guys, just so I'm not cutting somebody off. I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna stop the recording. Just letting you know, and you'll hear that announcement. Okay.